So, hi, thank you for attending this talk today. We're in a very challenging slot, uh, 5 p.m. after lunch, after you, you had some wine, but uh, I hope we'll do, we'll do good. <laughs> so, uh, exploring ancient ruins to find modern bugs, we will talk about uh, Microsoft RPC. For those of you who attended DEF CON last August, um, the first section of this presentation will be an introduction to RPC, so you may find it familiar. It's going to be quite the same, but we're exposing a different uh, vulnerability today and also sharing some nice open source tools for the first time. So let's start. Uh, this is Steve with me here, a senior security researcher in Akamai. Uh, we are both in enterprise security in Akamai, and I lead the security research team there where Steve uh, works together with me. These are, these are our Twitter handles, so if you want to follow our work, you're more than welcome. We do a lot of vulnerability research, but also malware analysis and reverse engineering of operating system internals. Mostly Windows, though. Let's start by asking uh, what MSRPC is and why we chose it. So MSRPC stands for Microsoft Remote Procedure Calls. It's a uh, model to allow a server to expose functionality either remotely or locally to various clients. The reason why we chose uh, to focus on MSRPC, which is Microsoft's implementation of the standard, is that it's basically everywhere. This is a screenshot from RPC View. Some of you may uh, know it. It's an open source project uh, showing lots of information on RPC. So this is just uh, RPC view running on a single machine, and it shows us the different processes on this machine that incorporate an RPC server. As you can see, the list is quite long. Many processes on Windows host an RPC server, and more specifically, a lot of the Windows services run RPC servers to expose the service functionality, again, either remotely or locally. But again, this is just one standalone machine. RPC is also very prominent in the network perspective. This is just a, a display of uh, one of the data centers that we're monitoring, and we're filtering here on port TCP 135. Again, some of you may know, we'll touch on it uh, a bit later. But the important thing to note here is all, all of these edges between the nodes. Every edge here represents a connection over TCP port 135, which is an RPC port. So really, you can see how prominent and popular this uh, protocol is in a Windows network. Here are just a couple of examples of Windows services that are utilized vastly as part of attacks on Windows networks and Windows workstations. Again, very, uh, very famous services here. We have distributed COM, encrypting file system, w WMI, service manager, and task scheduler. All of them expose their protocols over RPC. And we figured in our team that if we uh, target the protocol itself, RPC, maybe we manage to trigger functionality in the service that is otherwise restricted. Maybe we can uh, leverage RPC to gain more abilities from these services. So RPC is everywhere. It's used uh, as part of attacks on uh, Windows, and yet there is not as much research on it as I personally would expect. Uh, when you Google RPC or RPC keywords, you mostly stumble upon Microsoft's own documentation, which from our experience can be dazzling, uh, in particular because RPC is a standard that was written around 30 years ago, um, and also Microsoft's implementation. So it's quite old. This is why we call the talk uh, Exploring Ancient Ruins. Um, so this is for the documentation. There are several research-oriented blog posts, and we will refer to them later on. And, uh, but again, not many of them. And also with regards to disclosed vulnerabilities, Recently, there have been a couple of um, public vulnerabilities, specifically in the RPC runtime, but it's not a popular target. And we suspect or assume or I hypothesize that the reason for that is that it's old. It's not as shiny and brand new like cloud security or API security or 
other very uh, trending domains. But actually, this is one of the reasons why we decided to, uh, to dive in it. And what we had in mind was two end goals or achievements. So the first is lateral movement. Being able to exploit a remote RPC server may give us the ability to jump from one machine to another, invoke code execution on a remote RPC server. But also when, uh, when taking the local perspective, I mentioned that Windows services uh, run RPC servers and they also very often run with higher privileges. So again, if we manage to exploit the RPC server running as part of the service, we can maybe gain the services uh, privileges. So I hope uh, by this time we understand why MSRPC is an interesting target. And our agenda for today will cover um, RPC overview, a basic overview. And then Steve will take it to uh, describe some of the security flaws in MSRPC and a specific one that we focused on uh, as part of our research, how we automated some of the processes to be able to find not just one bug, but a couple of them. And finally, we'll deep dive into one vulnerability that Steve found. So, uh, introduction to MSRPC. Again, this is a section that was uh, already presented in DEF CON if you attended that. So, but it's a good reminder. So, by the end of this short section, the terminology I hope you will understand is appears on the screen, hopefully. So, all these terms will be understood if I do my job well. Let's try. So the RPC model, we uh, said it was a client-server model. The server exposes some fun functionality. Here in our case, the client wants to trigger a function called foo, which takes two parameters, an integer and a string. And uh, both client and server need to know of the existence of foo. So for that purpose, they agree upon an RPC interface. The interface is defined in a file, textual file, plain text file, uh, in the format IDL, Interface Definition Language. If we take this very simple file that we see on the screen, we will go top bottom. The IDL specifies the interface identifier, it's UUID. Right afterwards, we have the interface name, which is test in our case, and in that scope, we have uh, the function prototypes and the types of their um, return values and parameters. But this is a textual file. The client and server are both applications. So we need to compile this into something. For this reason, Microsoft has a compiler for IDL files, MIDL or middle. It takes an IDL file as input and produces as output header and source files for both sides to use, both client and server. So these header and source files can be later included in the application itself. Uh, so far, so good. They both know about the interface, but how does the client actually know who to connect to? For this purpose, uh, we have the notion of endpoints. Endpoint is simply the destination the client needs to connect to, and endpoints use transports, which are basically the communication mediums. A transport uh, can be one of the several examples we quoted here. Microsoft actually lists around 14 different transports. Some of them are deprecated, but here are the popular ones. So you see TCP, UDP, named pipes, HTTP, etc. These are the transports. Each one of them is represented using a protocol sequence, which is a string Microsoft defines for, um, for these transports. And the endpoint itself is the actual instance the client uses, uh, and the server too, actually. So it can be the TCP port number, the name of the pipe which is being used, the host name for an HTTP endpoint, and, um, and others. What's actually quite interesting to note here is that interfaces and endpoints are not tightly coupled. So if I want to uh, implement an RPC server, I can have one single interface and expose it through different endpoints over different transports, but I can do the opposite and expose several interfaces on one single endpoint. So that's quite interesting. I think it's uh, an interesting entry point for even more research. Now that we know the concept of endpoints, we can distinguish between a well-known endpoint and a dynamic one. 
a well-known endpoint, like you can guess, something that is known in advance, the client knows the server listens over TCP port 39776 and simply talks over, uh, over this port. But uh, when you hard code these TCP ports, obviously things can collide. It's not a healthy practice, so we have dynamic endpoints for that. So in Windows, we have a service called the Endpoint Mapper, or the EP Mapper, which is responsible exactly for that, for doing the mapping between RPC servers and their endpoints. With this case, the client simply talks to the EP Mapper, asks for the server interface the client is interested in, and in the response, they get back the endpoint which was dynamically allocated. Then with this information, the client can talk directly to the server. Now a couple of examples from uh, real world. This is Microsoft's documentation where they, um, they list interface UUIDs and endpoints. And I guess what I want to show here is that you can actually tell which services expose um, well-known endpoints and which ones dynamic ones. So for the task scheduler, for example, you see three different interfaces, but no endpoint is declared here. For the SCM, the Service Control Manager, and EFS, we actually see, um, see well-known pipe names. And just to kind of see the dynamic resolution process, just for demonstration purposes, let's look at a network perspective in Wireshark. So here the client talks to the endpoint mapper over port 135, which of course I forgot to mention, this is uh, the EP mapper's well-known port. This is the port I, oops, I uh, mentioned at the very beginning. There's the CCP handshake with the endpoint mapper, then a binding process, which is what I like to call the RPC handshake. And right after that, the client can ask the endpoint mapper for the, the server's uh, endpoint, in our case, the task scheduler. In the response, we see a TCP port 49666, which can later be used and is actually used here. So the client can now talk directly to the task scheduler TCP handshake, binding process, and we're done. And a session is established. I mentioned the word binding, so I'd like to elaborate on that a little bit. So binding is basically the logical representation of the RPC session between the client and the server. Uh, practically, it's a handle. When we're talking about code, it's just a handle. And both the server and the client can manipulate this handle to add more uh, relevant data for the session. It is mostly used for authentication, as we will uh, see in the next slides as well. But uh, just remember this concept as well. Now I think we covered all of the terms I listed at the beginning, but let's take a higher, um, higher view of the RPC call flow. So we have the client, the client wants to call foo. Foo is compiled by the MIDL compiler to a client stub. The stub then, uh, then invokes a client NDR, a function, NDR client call, which is an RPC runtime function. It is the first time I mentioned RPC runtime, I think, but it's actually the most integral part of RPC on Windows. It implements both client and server side functionality. So here we can see that the RPC runtime for the client is responsible for marshalling fu function parameters taking them and converting them to network representation, doing the actual connection to the server, uh, binding to the server, and authenticating if necessary. On the server side, the RPC runtime is responsible for listening to connections, accepting them, unmarshalling the parameters of the functions, and doing access checks if necessary. Eventually, the RPC runtime is the component that dispatches the call to the original function we requested, which is foo. And here, what I like to uh, mention at the very end of this section is that functions are not treated by their names in RPC and rather are uh, referred to using operation numbers, which is an important concept to remember. Opnums is the shorthand for that. Uh, the opnum is just the ordinal number of the function inside the interface. So foo was our first function, therefore its opnum is zero. I think with that, I covered everything I wanted for you to be ready for the next part. So just a quick recap. An interface is the kind of um, conceptual agreement of the functionality exposed by the server and is represented using a UUID. The transport is a communication medium 
represented by a protocol sequence. The endpoint is the de destination to connect to. It can be a port number, a pipe name, a host name, etc. And the binding is an object, it's a handle, which represents the client server uh, session in RPC. With that, I think we're ready to uh, talk a little bit about RPC in security, and I'll pass the ball to Steve for that. Thank you, Asir, um, and thanks the Hexacon team for having us. It's my very first conference talk ever, so I'm kind of excited, so thank you. Uh, and let's move on to the security and then the issues in MSRPC. So our first security mechanism is authentication, or the lack of it. By default, RPC connections are unauthenticated. In fact, authentication isn't even possible. For authentication to be possible in RPC, a server first has to register with an authentication service provider. Only after that has, has been made can then clients use that authentication uh, or to authenticate to the server over that uh, provider, like Kerberos or NTLM. The end result of this process, and it happens during the binding uh, process, is a security context uh, that is used to uh, verify the connection. The next security mechanism is the security callback, which is, is the mechanism we'll focus on. So the security callback is the way that RPC server developers can specify custom logic and security logic uh, to be triggered before any connection is made to the server. Um, it is done by registering a, 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 or giving a, a fu function pointer to the RPC runtime during server registration. And each time a client connects to the server, uh, the, the RPC runtime invokes that callback. Let's see a few examples of what they can do. Uh, our first example is the Internet Authentication Service. We can see that the first check the security callback does is checking if the client is local. The next check is checking the protocol sequence that is carrying over the connection. In this case, I can tell you that they check for um, ALPC, which is another form of a locality check. The last check they do is authentication level. Uh, of the authentication level is the, the level that they use to secure the connection with the security context or the authentication info. In this case, the security callback checks for packet privacy, which is the highest level, which is used to establish a secure or encrypted channel between the client and the server that only they can read and write to. Our next example is ELSAS. ELSAS also checks the protocol sequence that is carrying over the connection, but it does so based on the operation number that was requested by the client. So it means different clients want diff are, are allowed different, sorry, functions are allowed over different mediums. And it also does a check on the optime itself to make sure that it is not out of bounds. So with that, we know all the security mechanisms we want to focus on, but what can go wrong with a security callback? And the answer is caching. By default, the security callbacks are cached by the RPC runtime, uh, probably for efficiency. And this cache is per interface and per security context. Uh, so the, the only basic requirement for security contact for caching is authentication. No authentication, no caching. The only way that the server can change this behavior is to pass flags during its registration. It can pass a flag to disable the cache al altogether or it can pass a flash to restrict the, the caching to be per procedure instead of per interface. Let's see how caching is, looks like. So let's say we have a client in the server, uh, and once a client connects to the, or requests to connect or run a function on the server, it is basically handled by their RPC runtime. The RPC runtime knows that there's a security callback for the server, and it passes control to it. After the result from the security callback uh, returns to the RPC runtime, it continues the connection and keeps the uh, result in the cache to be triggered late, to be pulled later on on subsequent requests. But what can go wrong with this? Let's take a look at another scenario. In this case, again, we have the same client and server, and let's say that the client is allowed, sorry, is allowed to connect to the first function or run the first function, but it's not allowed to run the second function. But since we have caching, if the client were first to connect to optnum zero, 
and have and, and have it allowed, the result will be cached. And subsequent calls to opnum one will not go through the security callback, but from the cache, basically having a bypass and which allows us to call something that was restricted. So before moving on to what can we do with this uh, bypass, let's recap for a bit. RPC connections are unauthenticated by default. And for authentication to work, a server has to register with a security provider like Kerberos or, or NTLM. Uh, a security callback is a custom access check function that a ser an RPC server developer can specify to have more checks and security on their connection. And it is cached by default, which can lead to a bypass attack. So for that, we wanted to start looking for RPC servers that have both a security callback which and default caching behavior. But if you recall of first, one of the first of your slides, there's a lot of RPC servers on Windows. It's not going to be that feasible to go over each and every one. For that, we wanted to do automation. And basically, we can just scrape the, the file system and find all the RPC servers there. And the reason we chose file system and not memory like RPC view is because not all RPC servers are loaded by default. So the RPC uh, going through the file system would give a better coverage. So what are we looking for? We're looking for both info about interfaces that are exposed to servers and their functionality and how they're registered. Let's, the, let's discuss first interface. Uh, the Once uh, an IDL file is compiled into client and server logic, it is represented by a structure called RPC interface handle. And it is very easily av available. It can be found in the RPC header. Uh, inside it, we have a pointer uh, to another structure called the interpreter info, which also points to the table to a table of functions exposed by the RPC server. Um, RPC clients have the same structure, RPC interface handle, but they don't have this pointer, so we can differ differentiate between clients and servers. Next, for registration, all RPC servers has to be registered with a function called RPC server reg register function, a uh, register interface. There's a few of those, uh, regular two, three, and X, but this is the basic st structure. The, four, the first argument is the pointer to the same structure we've just seen, the RPC interface handle. The fourth argument is always flags. And the seventh argument, if it exists, is the security callback uh, function pointer. So with that, with that, we have a very basic uh, methodology. We want to find all the P files in the file system. We just go over uh, system32, for example. In each one of them, we want to find all RPC interface structures and then parse those structures to find function info and parse the registration to, to look for caching or caching restrictions. Uh, but how can we even look, find the RPC structures? This is how an RPC structure looks like in a binary. We have two fields here that are basically constant. The first field is the structure size, it won't change. And the second is the transfer syntax UUID. Transfer syntax is the way that is the protocol that the RPC runtime uses to marshal and unmarshal function parameters. There are only two of those defined in uh, MS RPC, and only one that we've seen in our research, which is pretty constant. Taking those two values, we can just create a regex or a error rule to find all RPC interface structures in, in binaries. Next, for registration, we can just look at disassemblers. Uh, since we know that all RPC servers has to be registered with RPC server interface, we can just find them, those functions with uh, this assembler and find all access to them. Then with just a simple matter of parsing the function parameters, like uh, the first, first argument is the interface handle pointer, the fourth is the flags, and the seventh is the security callback. Now, you might be asking me, Steve, why do we need then to use regex to find the interface structures if we, they are pointed here in the call. And you, we don't need to. We're, but the only reason we, we may want to find uh, all structures is because RPC clients are not will not be found do, with these assemblers, but they will be found using our first method with regex. While RPC clients aren't that necessary for a, a vulnerability research, they might be useful when we develop POC or exploit code 
because they are very nice reference on how to call uh, the RPC uh, interface. And this is a sample output. Uh, we have here a WIMSERV, which exposes uh, an interface with UAD long, something. <laughs> um, and it has three functions that we've just we've seen before in, in the previous example. And since it has those functions, we can also de deduct that it's a server. And all of this logic is implemented in an RPC toolkit that we've published and is linked here. You don't have to uh, copy the QR code. We'll upload the slides after the stock, but you're welcome if you want to. Uh, inside the toolkit, we have more than just uh, this uh, PRPC scraper. We also have various links to articles not written just by us that we've used when we learned about RPC and also to tools that were useful in our research. We also have links to uh, P vulnerability write-ups and POC codes uh, that we found as part of our research. And we also have a tool that Ophir wrote, uh, which is the IDL scrape and parcel. Um, since Microsoft also has documentation on many uh, RPC servers and protocols uh, and public facing IDL files, we just scrape them and have a parser to put all their data into a nice uh, CSV file. So let's re recap the methodology a bit. RPC interface information can be found in the P file that exposes this uh, the RPC interface. By scraping the file the file system and analyzing all P files, we can find all exposed RPC servers and their functionality. And we al can also check during by looking at the uh, server registration if there's a security callback and if it is cached. Using all of that, we can then turn over to vulnerability research. Um, and you don't have to take me on my word. We'll dive into a vulnerability that we found uh, in a bit. We basically found uh, three vulnerabilities using this method exactly. Uh, both of them were patched in this month's uh, Patch Tuesday. Uh, one was by me, that we'll dive into. One was by my teammate, Ben. And another one is still in the disclosure process. Uh, but there are more than 100 RPC servers with security callbacks that are cached by default. So there's a lot of more to cover. But now let's turn to uh, the Landmark Workstation Service, or WKS SVC. Uh, this service is on by default on every Windows machine, and it's responsible for uh, domain management and computer name management, and also on SMB network redirectors, like uh, file servers or SMB printer servers. It's accessible through uh, a named pipe, and it's also what is used by NetUse behind the scenes. This, uh, this uh, uh, service exposes an RPC interface, uh, and this is its registration. We have, of course, our pointer to the interface handle, but we can see that there are no flags that restrict the cache, which are hex 1480, and we have a security callback. So we have a security callback that can be, that is cached per interface, uh, like, in, like the default behavior. Also, looking at the security callback, we can see a very interesting behavior. The security callback restricts uh, opnums 8 through 11 to be only available locally. But since we have our bypass attack, we should be able to call them remotely if we want to. So what's the cache? What functions can we now look at? It's those four, net r use add, get info, del, and enum. And all of them are around using uh, or managing SMB network redirectors, like specifically like file shares and uh, uh, remote mappings. We look at net net use add. Um, sorry, this function is uh, can be used like net use add to create a mapping to a virtual uh, local drive like Z to remote uh, SMB uh, shared folder. If we can do that in our attack, we basically have a way to create a file mapping on the on the target, on the victim, which we, we can maybe later use. Let's look at the attack flow. First, we call a publicly uh, or remotely available function. Uh, in this case, we chose WKSDA get info, which is opnum zero. And since it's just very simple to call, it will go through the security callback, which sees opnum zero, which is allowed, and allow the connection and the result will be cached. Now, when we call netrusadd to point the victim to our attacker machine, 
We won't even go for the security callback since the RPC runtime sees that there's a result in the cache and it will just allow the connection. With this, we basically have uh, a mapping from the target server to uh, our machine, which we can later use. So does that mean we have a working POC and a, CS a CVE? Well, not yet. Um, remember I said that the only requirement for uh, caching was authentication. And the only requirement for authentication is that the server register with a security provider. Um, the WKS SVC doesn't register with anyone. But in something we found as part of the research, there's a very nice behavior that we dub as SSPI multiplexing. Basically, authentication in RPC is implemented with the Security Support Provider Interface, or SSPI. This is a very glorified way of saying that all um, security providers are basically DLLs that expose the same function names, so they can, they can all be called the same way. Now, when RPC servers uh, re register with an authentication provider, they basically just instruct the RPC runtime to load the corresponding SSPI DLL. And since they are DLLs, they should be shared in memory and are basically exposed to all servers. So let's look at this at this flow. We again have our client and server machine. And on the server, it has a process with two interfaces exposed. Uh, sorry, with, with two RPC servers of, of different interfaces. The first interface uh, registers with a security provider. In this, in this example, let's say Kerberos. And now clients that wish to authenticate uh, to interface A with Kerberos are allowed or can. But using other, other security providers like NPLM will be met with an error of unknown authentication service. But since Kerberos is now loaded into the RPC runtime, it, all of this is handled there. The client can also authenticate to interface B uh, with Kerberos, even though interface B never meant or wanted to have authentication. And this is relevant for us because WKS SVC is our interface B. Um, WKS SVC is part of the network provider service uh, service group, which means it's, it's loaded into SVC host with other services. And those other services do register with authentication providers for both NTLM and Kerberos, which means that we can now authenticate to WKS and have that caching so we can have our attack and bypass. The only requirement for SSPI multiplexing is older versions of Windows uh, before Windows 10 1703, because in newer versions of Windows, uh, Microsoft implemented something called service separation, which is that even uh, services from the same service group will be loaded into separate SVC host instances for I know security, reliability, uh, you pick your reason. Uh, and so this is the only requirement that we have either an older version of Windows or one where service separation is off. So now that we have our uh, authentication, it means we have caching and we have the bypass. Does that mean our POC is complete? Not yet. Um, turns out that NetRU's add creates, we have our mapping, it, it works, but it creates the mapping under our login session. And since we have to authenticate to the target to have caching means we always create a new login session and therefore it will always it will always create the mapping under a new login session that is separate to the one running on the target machine basically it means that we don't have any visible effect which renders our attack quite useless but remember i said that clients are important and can be a good reference when we look at the uh, lmu's header which is which describes the client uh, logic for RPC, for uh, WKS SVC, it, we can see a flag that is not really that well documented called use global mapping. If we pass this flag to NetRU's add, it will instead of creating it on our login session, it will create it in the global namespace, which will affect all login sessions that currently run on the machine uh, and not just for the user we, we, we authenticated with. This is a very nice effect that we can then use. And now we actually have our exploit and the attack works and we can have a, a network mapping to an SMB uh, share in our control. This yellow dot CVE, CVE uh, 38034 uh, categorizes elevation of privilege. And the only basic requirement for it is the one for SSPI multiplexing. 
uh, which is older uh, versions of Windows 10, or those with not enough RAM, so server separation is not available. But what can we do with this CVE? Well, we thought of two ideas about attacking. First, since we have an SM SMB machine in our control, we can require any client that connects to it to authenticate. We can either then store the anti-token uh, anti and crack it offline and then use it however we see fit, or we can relay it for an SMB, rel SMB relay attack. Next, we can also serve as a maybe phishing or made in the middle scenario and impersonate a file server in the network. Now, when, an, when a client requests a document, for example, we can just return a, a Trojan or a weaponized document and have the victim run a malware. But you don't have to take me on my road. I do have a demo uh, to showcase here. So let's take a look. First, we set up our uh, SMB machine. So we create a folder. In this case, we'll create a TXT file and not some and not malware, because it should be enough, and run an SMB server. Next, we just trigger our uh, exploit code, which will happen fast. But we can go over the, what happens on the network because it's more indicative. Our first call to uh, NetArguz add that we've added, that I've added for the import process is denied, as we expected, since we are not supposed to call it from remote. So we get access denied. Next, we just call um, WKSTA get info and get a response. Uh, hope you can see the right shark. Um, Get, get a response and a uh, successful response. And now when we call uh, netrus add, we do get the uh, an okay error message. So it means that the attack worked. Let's see how it looks like on the victim uh, perspective. So once the a user logs on to the machine, they're gonna see uh, a new mapping in their explorer. Once they access the file, we can see on the left side uh, on our SMB server, that they actually authenticate, and we can just store this authentication um, for later use. So that was for the demo, and <laughs> thank you. Um, and this is basically the end of the talk and the section, so let's summarize for a bit. Um, security callbacks are a very nice security feature in RPC but they are also an interesting attack surface because they are cacheable and this cache is by default and interface wide. Uh, we've shared our authentication, uh, automation, sorry, uh, methodology in this talk, but we also shared it in our RPC toolkit in case anyone, anyone wants to uh, take this research uh, further on. In terms of future directions that we've thought about is first looking at more RPC servers and services uh, since we've covered maybe three, four, but they are uh, in our research, but there are more than 100 uh, RPC servers that still might be uh, vulnerable to something. We also want to develop uh, caching effects that don't really involve open objects, since those are much rarer than the rest. And lastly, we even want more more automation, because right now our toolkit and scraper just finds servers that have a security callback and default caching behavior. But we should, it, sh it shouldn't be that much harder to add more automation that analyzes automatically the security callback, for example, or even some sort of fa fuzzing on queries themselves. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Dexacon team, again, for having us. Uh, and questions, if there are.